Galatians 2 verse 20. Galatians 2 20. Great verse, good memory verse. It says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, people make a big deal about, and there's some truth to it, that God doesn't love the world. He, he loves new creatures. He's angry with the wicked all the time. Don't push that too far. Paul's saying right here, who loved me? He's referring to before he was saved. So before he was saved, God loved him. God loves the potential to make everybody on this globe a new creature in Christ Jesus because Jesus paid their debt. All they have to do is recognize that he paid it. And God would love to welcome them, welcome them in. The only reason a person goes to hell is because they choose to. God's already paid the price. Everything's done. Just accept it. Every Christian has three lives. You have the life where you were dead in Christ. If you accepted him, you were considered, your old man was considered to have gone into the grave, buried. And we're buried with Christ. He says we're risen with Christ. And now you live and walk by Christ. So you had a whole complete death and resurrection already. The crucified life is the one we should live daily. The one where we consider the flesh, the deeds of the old man to be dead. That's a hard one to do, but it's something that we continue to hopefully improve on the longer we're saved. In order to live each life, each day of this life the way we should, we have to do it by faith. Because what you see with your eyeballs is not going to tell you the same thing that faith will tell you. In Romans chapter 6, we get a lot of information on this. Romans chapter 8, I'm not going to make you read that, but <laughs> those are good chapters that describe the life that was and that now is if you've been made a new creature and how we should live after the things that are faith, after the things that God gives us, not after what our eyeballs tell us. <laughs> In Colossians, look at chapter 2, verse 6. Colossians 2, verse 6, he says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. <laughs> the two, the one doesn't mean you'll do the other. <laughs> he said, you've received him, you're saved, now start living like it. <laughs> And that's not a one time and you're done. That's a thing that has to be done maybe many times a day. Look in the mirror and say, hey boy, you're not walking the way you should. <laughs> okay. Um, he said in our verse there that uh, um, Galatians 2.20, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, we've covered it before, but the Son of God, that phrase or sons of God, is something you'll need to know because that opens a doctrinal thing and it helps explain many of the confusing things in the Bible. There's different classifications of a son of God. Adam is considered a son of God because he was created perfect at the time of creation. You and I, when you're born into this world, are not considered a son of God because you're not created perfect and sinless and in fellowship with God immediately in uh, th there's several places I'm not going to make you turn there Genesis 5 and in Luke 3 he talks about Adam being the son of God or a son of God angels are considered sons of God the the prime example is in Genesis 6 says when the sons of God saw the daughters of men so that some angelic being saw humans and decided he wanted to be a human too okay so an angelic thing can be considered a son of God it's created perfect at the time of creation the nation of Israel is considered the son of God he called his son out of Egypt referring to Israel and of course a Christian is considered a son of God as well when you get saved, you're given the power to be the sons of God. 
Christ, of course, is the only begotten Son of God. There's a little difference there. He's a begotten Son of God. Galatians 2, look at verse 21. Galatians 2, 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Well, no, duh. <laughs> That's such a basic, simple truth that clears up all the confusion that religion creates. Religion creates a list of endless rules. But he says, hey, look, if we needed all of those rules, then why did Christ have to die? <laughs> okay. So your justification is not through anything that man puts on you. It's through something Jesus already did. It's so simple. And he said, it is simple, and I'm not going to try to overcomplicate it. Because you know what happens if he did? If he tried to overcomplicate something God made simple, he'd be teaching heresy. Uh, Jesus' death meant uh, nothing as far as we're concerned if we have to do something for salvation. Then there was no point in Jesus' coming he would have just sent down another angel to say, y'all better get on the ball. <laughs> the rules are written. Get with it. No. He came and did something spectacular no human could do. Um, Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Next chapter. This book is going to compare two things. The Old Testament system that is no longer in effect of doing works and New Testament salvation, the church age in Christ Jesus, and people trying to convince Christians that, hey, you don't have what it takes. The rules are where it's all at. <laughs> and Paul's confronting this thing. Verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Christ Jesus hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? The Galatians here, they're Gentiles, and they'd received the gospel of Jesus Christ the right way. But then it seems like somebody came along, according to our verse, and he said they're foolish for believing it. Somebody had come along and had some smooth speeches they gave them, and convincing arguments, and said, you may have got saved that way, but you won't stay saved that way. You better obey these rules. And that's a lot where religion goes. A lot of times religion goes, you need to continue something in order to be saved. And they'll give you whatever their list is, and that's subject to change without notification. <laughs> he said there in our verse, Christ was set, uh, be, was set forth, crucified among them. Uh, Paul's testimony and preaching, of course, bore witness to Christ's crucifixion, so he had painted it before their eyes. But not only that, before many of them, he had probably literally been crucified. We're just a few years down the road from the crucifixion. So this is not something that was hidden and not known to the vast majority of people. Remember, Rome is running the show now. And this was probably a headline in the news. I don't think they had newspapers, but <laughs> everybody knew it. This was a big deal. Right, right. <laughs> There's no secret here. Second Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians 4, verse 10. He says, Always a bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Okay, so what he said there is Christ died. And if you've been put into him, let that body be considered dead and always tell it it's dead. Always be dragging around a dead corpse, bearing about that body. So that like Christ raised from the dead, we should be walking a new life. He said that, Christ, uh, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. How can a dead corpse move? It can't unless something alive is moving it. Like if you go out and, I've got ants, buddy, I've got ants. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But if you'll see an ant, an ant will be carrying something huge. It'll carry something bigger than its body, and you can't see the ant. And you look down and you think, how is that stick moving? And then you see the little ant down there crawling around. That's what the world should be seeing with us. A dead body being moved around. That's Jesus Christ's life moves this dead body. Galatians 2, uh, 20, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Okay, that's past tense. That's done and over with. He says, nevertheless, I live. Okay, so there's something about it. The I is still in there. I live. The soul is still a controller. The soul can decide, I want to do the deeds of a dead corpse. Sit around and rot and stink and, you know, be filled with maggots. <laughs> the soul can decide, I'm going to obey the lust of the flesh. Or... It can decide, I'm going to live the life of Christ, or let like Christ's life live through me. Look at Philippians 1, Philippians 1, verse 21. Philippians 1, 21. Now, those were spiritual applications. Here's Paul talking about a spiritual application, or those were spiritual applications. Here's a physical application. For to me to live is Christ. That is, while I'm walking around on this globe, it should be Christ that's living in me, walking around on this globe. And to die, that is, for this body to go into the grave and never rise again, as far as man's concerned, is gain. Okay, that's a good one. That is, you can't threaten me with heaven. When I leave, when I die, I don't really die. I never die. Um, we never see death. And that means a whole lot because in the tribulation, death's going to ride in and it's going to be literal, a personification of death. And hell's going to follow it. Galatians 3, look at verse 2. Galatians 3, verse 2. This starts his doctrinal discourse on this subject of works for salvation or works to maintain your salvation. He says, this only would I learn of you. Received you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He said, I got a question for you. How did you get saved? Did you get saved by doing any works of that law? The law they're bringing to you, telling you, you got to obey this and you got to obey that. Was that powerful enough to get you saved? Well, how's it going to be powerful enough to keep you saved? The whole thing is not about how to be sanctified. How to be a better Christian. He's talking about how to be a Christian, period. Because these people were entering in telling them, unless you do these laws that Moses set forth, you can't maintain salvation. It's, um, it's uh, I don't know if that would be considered Calvinism or not. It's, it's that you have to persevere. You have to do something in order to maintain your salvation. We don't have to do anything. I couldn't do anything to get it. I'm sure not going to be strong enough to hold on to it. Good thing I'm in his hands and he's responsible for the holding. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1 verse 13. Now this is probably a verse to Mark. This is one of the most clear spots in the Bible where he talks about receiving the Holy Spirit. In whom, ye trust, in whom uh, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, so it takes Bible, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you believe what you heard, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. You didn't do the sealing, so you can't unseal it. <laughs> you weren't strong enough to unseal it. That's a man's job. That's a husband's number one job when he gets married is to pop the seal on all the jars. <laughs> She's going to say, I can't open this. Open it for me. And for you to you know, justify you being a male, you have to be able to turn the lid and hear the little pop. <laughs> that's the fact. Now, Jesus Christ, God, is the only one that could pop that seal because he's the one who sealed you. 
So don't even try it. <laughs> works couldn't put the seal on there, and works can't take the seal off. Galatians 3, verse 3. Paul is um, being hard on them here. He says, are you so foolish? He called them a fool in verse 1, and now he's turned around and called them a fool again. He likes using this. Um, it's kind of a shock value statement. He's doing it to say, look, the argument that you've been uh, swindled into believing is pure foolishness. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? No, the flesh was killed. It wasn't made perfect. A saved man begins his Christian life by faith. And that faith is not by himself. That faith is from God. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, either the grace or the faith is not of you. It is the gift of God. Um, the question is, if you start in the Spirit, can doing something in the flesh make your flesh better? No. The flesh is never better. Getting saved does not make your flesh good. When you got saved, you killed it. That's how good you got it. <laughs> flesh never gets better the only time the flesh is valuable is when Christ remakes it at the rapture he's going to blow the old flesh apart and bring it back together as something new and that flesh is going to be so great that it can fly through the air that's how good it's going to be Romans 7 verse 24 Romans 7 verse 24 that's right. That's right. <laughs> Romans seven twenty four. Paul, he says, Oh wretched man that I am. Wait a minute. Wretched? Come on, you you gotta see you gotta love yourself. Isn't that the, the phrase they use now? You gotta learn to love yourself. Paul needs to be told told that one. <laughs> no, he says the body is no good. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The only thing the flesh can teach you is how to die. <laughs> it does. The things the flesh wants lead to death. What the spirit wants, those lead to life everlasting. Your flesh can't please God. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 8. Romans 8, verse 8, says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, that means every human. Every human has flesh on. But we don't have to live after the flesh. If you're saved, the flesh is considered dead, and we shouldn't be living after its demands. We should be living after the demands of the Spirit. He says, So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That is, you can't please God by doing what the flesh said. And the flesh a lot of times doesn't say do something bad. It says do something good and pat yourself on the back for it. You don't get any credit for it. He said in Hebrews, without faith it's impossible to please him. So we know it's possible to please God. But he says they that are in the flesh can't please him. So faith is something you do that's not a part of the flesh. So whenever the flesh says do this or do that, point the flesh right back to faith. In order to please God, you have to crucify the flesh. Consider it dead. The only true good thing in a human is Jesus Christ when he gets saved. Now, Christ in you. So Christ came in you when you got saved. And that's a thought that just is mind-blowing. That Jesus Christ the God, part of the Godhead moved into your body. That's a good thought. And the scary thought is that sometimes we don't let him do what he wants to. That makes us pretty powerful. In Colossians, he talks about will worship. That's obeying the flesh. The flesh has a will that it wants, a strong will. And that means to, to determine, a, a human determination. Now, the greatest counterfeit to faith is will worship. I'll determine this. I'll pull myself up by my own bootstraps. One of the worst things 
that has happened in America is man has begin, begun to believe that his destiny is based on him. America is not great because Americans were great. Americans were always great because they had great faith in a great God. And that gave them something good. But when man becomes to be a humanist and makes flesh the God, then he's replaced faith with fantasy. And that's will worship. Um, Colossians 2, look at verse 6. Oh, I already, already gave you that one. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. I like that he put the whole God in, uh, the whole name there, his full name. Christ Jesus the Lord. <laughs> now, each one of those means something. Christ is the anointed one. Jesus was the human that walked the earth. And the Lord is God in heaven. And he is the Trinity. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, don't let somebody tell you that Jesus wasn't God. And there is a whole group of people out there that will do that. Um, there's, uh, I just heard of somebody who decided that th there's no such thing as the Trinity. <laughs> You'll run into these nuts. <laughs> because that word is not in the Bible. People go crazy trying to say, well, if a word is not used in the Bible, then we shouldn't be using that word. Okay, toilet paper's not in the Bible. Quit using it. <laughs> no, you can use any word that describes what the Bible's talking about. That's okay. Baptist, as far as a denomination, is not in the Bible either. Uh, we use many terms that are not biblical. Paul never said the phrase church age, yet we understand what that means. Rapture's not in there, that's right. We understand what it means, it's okay. So just because Trinity, the, the, the phrase, is not used, find out the Godhead is used. And you can use that, and you can find the Godhead very clearly stated in the Bible. Galatians 3, look at verse 4. Galatians 3, verse 4. This is where it gets pointed. His argument started out theological and theoretical. Now he's going to put it on them practically. He says, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? The suffering in the verse is probably a reference to the fact that some of the Galatians had suffered persecution for being a Christian. Being a Christian in that day and age was not a vain thing. You claimed to be a Christian, you were ostracized. You were persecuted. So they had already taken a stand. Now they were beginning to slip back into Judaism, getting comfortable. He said, let me ask you something. All of that suffering you did for claiming to be a Christian, was that done in vain? If it really was in vain? Look at uh, Galatians 6, Galatians 6 verse 12. He says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the, uh, a fair show in the flesh... They can strain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the uh, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. This is going back to Judaism. So why don't you come in and consider yourself a messianic Jew and be circumcised and obey these rites and religious rules? You can still hold to that Jesus thing. Just do these things of the Old Testament so that we can consider you a good Jew too. He says they do that so that they, uh, that's the alternative to suffering the persecution of the cross of Christ. If you claim to be a Christian without ties to Moses' law, then you were persecuted. They would put you on the hot seat then. Um, they say nowadays, if, uh, if they opened up the Inquisition again, would there be any evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Okay, well, this would have been the evidence to convict them of being a Christian. 
do you do the works of the law to maintain your salvation? And that's what this whole book is about. Salvation, you don't get it by works and you can't keep it by works. Um, Galatians 3, 5, we'll try one more. Galatians 3, 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now he said an interesting phrase in there. We've got too much information here for me to cover all of this. We'll pick up there next week, but I'm just going to show you one thing. <laughs> he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit. That's a, 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 a very mislooked phrase, I think, in the Bible. That when somebody is ministering, preaching to you, they're ministering the Spirit. That's why it's important to go to church. Because the Spirit comes to life when somebody's talking about God and preaching the Bible. It's important to be around other Christians talking about Christian things. Every spirit attracts or detracts another spirit. In Job, he says, whose spirit came forth from you? Good question. When you're around somebody, you automatically minister some sort of spirit. And sometimes it's very clear and plain. You can go into some places and you can just hear what's being said and it, it grieves your spirit. Your spirit, you can feel it in your spirit. Sometimes you go into a place, a lot of times you can feel it with music. You go into a place where there's real worship of God and your spirit comes to life and you can feel it. Okay, the spirit is ministered. And by that he meant the real spirit. Look at it, it's capital. Uh, he therefore that ministereth to you the spirit. Now, Paul's not saying you get more of the Holy Spirit. You, you got all of him you can get when you got saved. There ain't more to get. <laughs> the charismatics want you to have a second dose of it. <laughs> There's no second dose. One dose will do you for a lifetime. And you can't get more of the Spirit. But he's ministering it to you. Meaning he's speaking the things that your spirit agrees with. You should have an agreement. The Holy Spirit in you should come to life when you hear the Word of God. Because that's what it is. It is the Word of God. Jesus Christ's name is the Word. And when you hear the Word of God, it makes the Word in you come to life. The two should click. Uh, okay, we better stop it there and then we'll pick up on another uh, thought in that verse next time.